All right, well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm glad to see you all here today. We have a terrific guest with a great topic, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We have, right now, for several years in the forum, been exploring race and racism on American campuses. We've been hosting a whole series of great faculty, staff, scholars to discuss this issue. But one aspect that we haven't really focused on enough is the experience of students, specifically minoritized students on campus. This is why I'm really grateful to introduce you all to Professor Antar T. Jabakunda. Uh, from Cincinnati, he's a professor who specializes in education, and his most recent book is a deep dive into how black students on majority white campuses succeed, how they thrive, how they survive, what kind of worlds they create, and that is a subject for this week's conversation. So without any further ado, let me welcome Professor T. Chagunkunda to the stage. Greetings, Cincinnati. Hello from Cincinnati. Thank you, <laughs> thank, thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in. I'm super excited to chat. Well, I'm really, really grateful uh, to welcome you, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, uh, Antar, we were talking about this earlier. The, the way we usually ask people to introduce themselves is to describe what they're going to be working on for the next year. So I, what are the big projects? What are the classes? What are the ideas that are really going to be top of mind for you for the next 12 months? That's such a great question. And I mean, for, first and foremost, I'm like, OK, uh, one of the things I'm working on is trying to uh, center joy, right? Like I'm wearing this black mm. joy shirt. And I think it's super important that we center joy right now in these uh, times, right? These continued unprecedented times, right? So uh, as I often tell my students, you know, you have, you're not good if you're not good. So I want to make sure that I'm good taking care of myself. Um, but as far as like academic endeavors, I'm really interested in extending this work on Black student life and thinking more about labor, um, thinking more about labor on campuses. One of the things that I've noticed in my work, I often say, yeah, I'm, I'm here to support uh, black students and black communities at these predominantly white institutions, right? Um, but I noticed in some of my writing, after I do, did a little more reflecting, I'm like, whose voices are absent, right? I've talked to administrators, I've talked to faculty, I've talked to staff, mm -hmm. I've talked to students. Um, and I was like, ah, am I talking to the custodians? Mm -hmm. Am I talking to the talking to people who are, you know, at the cash registers and, you know, mm -hmm. in the cafeteria, I'll talk to them in, you know, in general, when I'm on campus, but I'll, I mean, what do they have to say about campus life and university? And I know we can learn a lot from them. So I would love to do some of that work, especially where I'm at, right? Like, you know, if I'm looking at the black community at UC, a large part of the black community are people who make the university run, right? Okay. So uh, think about labor, uh, the labor that they do, think, especially think about essential workers, right? Who are the essential yeah. workers on campus? I know that's a really fraught term, but really kind of digging into that and also about the labor black students do. So the labor of um, creating a black student union, oftentimes yeah. it's unpaid, right? Yeah. Like you, most of the time it's unpaid. People say that, oh, this is a black student group. You should want to do this. Or even like black fraternities and sororities, you should want to do this, right? And, you know, it, and for those of you who are here who work on at institutions, it's not uncommon to tap those you know, black student leaders to talk to prospective students, talk to prospective black students, right? Yeah, yeah. What thanks do they get for that? They get a thank you, uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. they, they get the, you know, that feeling of doing something for the community. What if we compensated them, right? So one of the yeah. things that I'm arguing in my, in a little bit in my book, but I want to really dig into later is, uh, you know, I think a lot of black students who are doing, they're doing the diversity work for campus. And until we pay them, we are exploiting them. Um, so I really want to dig into labor um, as like kind of like my next project. That's a great, great idea. And you've got some uh, support in the chat already where people are recommending this. Um, and I think that would be terrific. And that's a population that kind of hit very, very hard in the past two years. Totally. Uh, in terms of uh, just suffering from the pandemic and losing jobs. And mm -hmm. uh, oh, that would be terrific. Yeah. Well, well, um, I'm really looking forward to that book. Uh, once you get that done, uh, good luck with it. <laughs> but we'll bring you back. Yeah. Um, so, friends, if you're new to the forum, this is a place for all of you to ask your questions. And I'm going to start. I'm going to start off with a couple just to get the ball rolling. In case you haven't had a chance to read uh, Professor Teach Abakunda's book, um, and as he speaks, think about how that connects with your own experience at your own institutions or at other institutions, and 
now was the time to start forming up your questions and your thoughts. Uh, I'm just, I'm very, very curious in, in doing all this work and looking at the experience of black students at predominantly white institutions, what were some of the most standout results of your research? What are some of the major findings either that you think are the most salient or that were the most surprising? So, I mean, one thing I think about is group work. Um, I'll talk about two things. I, I could talk um, hours about this, <laughs> but one thing I'll talk about is group work. The other thing I'll talk about is um, kind of like the blues, right? The blues. So group work, I, I just have to say this, right? Professors oftentimes think group work is, uh, you know, this is a creative way that I can engage students. You know, uh, it seemed as like, okay, this is a useful pedagogical tool. Let's do some group work. Um, what I found, you know, in my book, I look at black engineering students, right? So I found at this institution, uh, which I call West Side University, black students were such a marginal population that oftentimes they were the only black student or their major in that class, right? So obviously there may be some overlap, but oftentimes it's easy. It, it's not uncommon for them to be the only black student in all their engineering classes. Mm. What does it have to do with group work? When it's time to group work, split up into partners, Oftentimes I heard from black students that they would get picked last, they wouldn't get picked at all, or when they did join the groups, they made the experience, for lack of better words, hellish for the black people, especially oh. black women. I found oh. there were at least three students, three black women, who opted to do group work by themselves rather than work in the groups with other people. Wow. So you think about that, right? Like you have people who are literally working twice as hard, doing group work individually because they'd rather do that then deal with the, uh, you know, massage noir, the gendered racism mm -hmm. for black mm -hmm. women um, that they would incur in that group, right? And there was oftentimes no uh, thought from the professor about making sure that these were these groups were friendly or inclusive, right? So that's one thing I'll say, group work. Uh, to what extent do black students in engineering, but also other classes and, you know, um, uh, disciplines, how do they have access to fair group environments? There's another student, another black woman who did woman who did everything right, right? She was a mechanical engineer. She she was in the uh, extracurricular group. She was representing the Caldwell, uh, the, the School of Engineering, right? Uh, she did everything right. She had friends, but she was a junior in college, and she still didn't have a steady group, a steady study group to work with. And that wasn't for lack of trying, right? She did everything. Oh, like get to know people, this, that, and the third. But I have evidence of like students just not responding to black students for uh, you know. Hey, are you all meeting later? Right? Like students would screenshot these uh, messages and be like, yeah, this is a day in the life. Like no one wants to work with the black student, you know? Um, so group work is one thing that I'll, I'll mention that I was like, I've never thought about. Related to that, also cheating. Cheating. No one wants to talk about that. Students cheat, you know? And, and I think we need to also think about what, what we mean by cheating, right? Is cheating just collaboration, right? But things that professors would think is unsavory or they wouldn't want, um, Oftentimes students would do. And it would, from my experience in studying these students, a lot of this like unorthodox study practices or, uh, you know, uh, what is it, uh, you know, test banks, they were divided either by like engineering society or fraternity or by race, you know? So you have a lot of the white students sharing, you know, grouping up, a lot of the South Asian students grouping up. Mm -hmm. And if the black students wanted to group up, it was just that one black student. So literally you have other students cheating to get a better grade, messing up the curve, while the black student is forced to do the right thing, right? So literally working twice as hard to get half as far while people are cheating. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one thing I was very surprised, another one I was really surprised at. The other thing that I'll stop, I mentioned the blues, right? Um, in, in, in other readings of this book in the draft phases, like my advisor and other people were like, it seems kind of sad, you know? like these experiences, like they're not getting in, into groups and all that, like they're being pushed out. But there was so much more to the sadness. There was also life, there was resilience. There was this type of fortitude that black students had in life that they made, right? And there was this acceptance, mm. like, hey, people may not wanna work with me, but I'm still gonna do the best that I can. And I'm gonna make a life within this black engineering association, NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineering Students. Um, so they, they made a life within that chapter, within that black space. And you know, it, it was it was a dynamic life, a beautiful lives that they made, right? But it was all within that context of this kind of anti-black racism. So I found an answer in the blues as far as reconciling the tension between um, you know, racism that did exist and shaped their lives, but also their um, you know, their persistence and their 
uh, unwillingness to be defeated by it, right? And they're living out loud, you know, succeeding, thriving in spite of it. So those are the two things that I, and I'll, I'll stop there. Well, those are fantastically important findings, and and the and the first one is is the first ones are especially daunting and 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 frustrating. Um, I mean, you spent just just thinking about being that marginalized and, and that uh, that alone, but then at the same time doing what you said in the second part of uh, being able to make a vibrant and beautiful life at the same time. Yeah. Um, I, I'm 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 curious when as as you were doing all of this work, um, this was done in the past few years, right? A lot of their field work on this. Yes. How did how did the huge um, wave of racial reckoning or the great awakening um, impact this? Uh, or did that happen uh, too late in your writing process? Yeah, yeah, so this was, I mean, this was done during, I think like between 2016 and 2018, right? So this is before what, what was in the 2020, uh, you know, reckoning, right? It's like a reckoning after reckoning after reckoning. Uh, at mm -hmm. what point is it just like, I don't know, uh, the mundane, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. but this was after what students called the campus climate era. Um, so if you all remember in like 2015 or so, um, there was the Concerned Student Movement, Concerned Student 1950 at Mizzou, right? Where you had these mm -hmm. student mm -hmm. activists who came together. Uh, one student led a, a hunger strike as well. And that kind of really, it was almost a domino effect of other institute, other uh, student activists, um, predominantly black, um, but also across racial lines who list out these demands, right? So my study kind of happened at the heels of this um, campus climate era, if you will. So it was, you know, temporal moment matters. So this was at the, you know, right at the end of that, um, or, or right after, I should say, a lot of these act these uh, protests and movements were happening nationwide on college campuses. Okay. So, I mean, the, so the campus climate act language will still be a-, a Oh, language. definitely. Yeah. Uh, in the in the chat, uh, Tom Haynes, uh, notes uh, he's a government professor and he notes that this sounds disturbingly like the situation under jim crow where african-americans are forced to essentially construct their own parallel society yeah uh, friends i have all kinds of questions uh for our guests and i would i would but i would much much rather hear from you uh what what are your questions about his research uh what can you ask or comment on based on your own experience uh what would you like to ask him so as people are, are, you know, you can start to see the smoke coming out of people's ears as they're trying to figure out what to what to ask. Um, let me follow up with uh, with another one. Uh, how how have institutions best supported black students? I mean, but in here these are the predominantly white institutions. What are the most effective and powerful things they've done to help address the kind of problems you're talking about? That's a good question. Um... And I think often, I mean, just in, in the discipline that I'm in, I'm, I'm very good. We're socialized, uh, if you will, to disciplined to look for problems, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Less often are we tasked with finding solutions. True. Um, but I, I would say one is, you know, creating black spaces, black places and supporting them on campus, mm -hmm. providing them with a requisite infrastructure, right? So mm -hmm. you have black cultural centers and you have, you staff these centers. It's still not enough, but it's, that's something I think that, uh, creates a measurable difference for black students on campus. You have uh, black residence halls, right? And you invest in that. Um, you have uh, different types of supports. I'm, I'm really big on like, how are you investing in black student life, right? But those are, I think, I, to what extent can you invest in, uh, you know, black places on campus and also black student groups on campus? Uh, black students, should, if, you're, if you're leading NESB, National Society of Blacks and Engineering, you shouldn't have, these students in these chapters shouldn't have to beg the university for money, right? Um, the least the university can do is make uh, these pathways for uh, students to get money to, you know, feed, feed um, engineering students who come to these meetings. That should be the least of their worries, right? Um, so I think about how universities can invest in these student groups, invest in black student spaces. Um, and, you know, I, I think critical mass helps, right? Um, at the end of the day, if you have a 2% black population in the School of Engineering, regardless of what you do to support those 2% of black engineers, I can't understand that school is anything but anti-black, right? It's 2%. <laughs> like, you, you, you're, you're not doing the work to get black students at these schools, right? And we know it's not because it's not a pipeline issue, you know, um, there, there are, you know, yeah, it's not a pipeline issue. I think it's a will issue. So I think about critical mass. Ooh. 
what are universities and what are you know high schools doing to ensure that black students can go to these institutions or support black students at these institutions so also about critical mass and enrollment but at the end of the day um it's per perhaps a more tangible thing i think invest in black students you know and i mean invest not just uh with you know um you know oh we appreciate you not just during black history month pay black students you know like how are you helping them with tuition how are you helping them with books i really think about reparations right so what does that look mm. like mm. on the college level um and, and you know another thing that i think will be great in the future like i said if you lead a black student organization i don't think you should pay tuition on campus um because it is a job right um a job different from like uh you know ncaa basketball football players but you are doing work for the university so i think that would be another way to uh aid in uh, black student engagement and support black students is anybody doing that right now um i, I know of one school that pays all kind of like their student leaders um mm -hmm. if they're mm -hmm. recognized by the university but i don't i don't think so well this would and it would be for a for a campus for a college or university it would be a trivial amount for their budget yeah uh, but this could really make a huge difference in yeah. people's lives um uh, I was going to ask more questions, but already the questions have started coming in, and I want to give people uh, um, their chance to do this. So first of all, this is uh, uh, Sarah, and Sarah, if I've mispronounced your name, I'm sorry. Um, I don't recognize the, the, the spelling. I want to make sure I get it right. She asks, what motivated or encouraged you, you to continue studying despite these racialized circumstances? A uh, very personal question. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so... I mean, for me, I'm, I'm very interested in, you know, black student life. I went to a predominantly white institution myself. I went to Brown University. The time I went there, mm -hmm. it was 6.4% um, black, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and, and, I, and I remember reading a lot of the research around black students, you know, and if you read a lot of the research around black students, pretty much a lot of the, you, you see a lot about how black student life is agonizing, right? And how black students are other and have a little little sense of belonging, you know, um, how they're victims of microaggressions and other types of racism. Mm -hmm. All these things are true, right? But what I didn't see in the research was like how black students are agentic, you know, have mm -hmm. collective agency, mm -hmm. come together and create beautiful environments and experiences for themselves. Right. I'm thinking about that kind of note in the chat about, you know, Jim Crow kind of separate societies, right? On campus. I think a lot of that's happening. Like even at the school that I'm at, like it's in in social world, the social circles are very much segregated, but there's just as much life in these black social worlds. And that's what I wanted to highlight in my work, you know, just kind of highlighting that agency, that creativity, the ingenuity. Um, and yeah, just, just the life that is there. And I think by studying what black students are already doing to support themselves, we can at the very least make sure institu institutions get out of black students way or, you know, <laughs> figure out ways to support what they're already doing. Well, and this sounds like this was a way that you proceeded um, yourself in your own career. Definitely, definitely. Well, thank you for that answer, and, and mm -hmm. Sarah, thank you for the question. And if you're if you're new to the forum, that's an example of using that uh, Q and A box just by pressing on that on a question mark and typing it up. We have another question from Lynn Sabolsky, and we flashed this on the screen too. Uh, schools located in predominantly white areas, even if the campus is safe, you have to leave campus sometime. What kind of steps can schools take to make their communities safer and more attractive? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. I'm automatically thinking about um, I'm thinking about the University of Cincinnati, where I'm at now. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm also mm -hmm. thinking about uh, University of Southern California, where I did my studies. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes there's this um, antagonistic relationship between the university and the community. Right. Um, I, I don't know. It's like representatives or orientation almost speak about the community in hushed tones, right? Oh, you have people from the community, you know, and you're like, oh, what do you mean by that? Are you talking about black and brown people? Like, what are you, what are you saying? Um, and these feelings of antagonism are created, I think, by universities, right? Universities um, kind of making it more expensive to live in these areas, you know? So you have people, you have a lot of disgruntled folks in the neighborhood, right? People in the neighborhood who've been there for, for years or generations. So. I, I think that's a task for you. It's a big task, but I think it's a task for universities to think about how they can reach out and do a better job of, you know, serving the communities in which they're housed in, right? You're not only serving uh, the students, right? 
Um, if you put up a wall, if you put up a fence, you're you're signaling to the uh, community, I don't want you here, right? So it's on university to be creative and okay, what can we do to for our image, but also materially for people in like you know whether it's a two or three mile mile radius, what can we make? What can we do to make sure that they feel welcome here too? Because then I feel like there's less of that antagonism, right? Um, I think it's a beast of an issue, right? And it, it's not yeah. just all universities. It's uh, for, you know, you think about the under-resourced neighborhoods in general. It's on uh, cities too, right? To support um, and provide equitable access to different neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods surrounding a lot of these cities in urban environments. But I do think, I don't think putting up walls is the, um, and obviously that's not the question, but I see a lot of universities kind of doing that. I don't think that's a useful answer or approach. Thank you for yeah. the question. Oh, it's a fantastic question. And thank you for that very, very rich and, uh, and nuanced answer. It reminds me once of uh, one college, which I won't name, which built a three-dimensional virtual reality uh, replica of their entire college. And they carefully kept the surrounding town off. It was just blank. And wow. there's no sign of it. They had to like, go to great lengths to make that occur. Yeah, that um, says a lot. Yes, it does. Uh, we have more questions flooding in, which is terrific. So let me just put this one up on stage from Carrie Watkins. Hello, Carrie. What role do faculty mentoring, sponsoring, and advising play in helping black students in majority white schools? And how has that helped or exacerbated issues? I'm loving all the questions, y'all. Thank you so much. Um, but as far as uh, faculty, when I was studying um, this, the university for my book, um, when I when I wanted to interview faculty, right, I, I almost I was doing kind of like cold emails, and there were like three people that responded very quickly, and these were the, these three faculty members were the ones that always show up to the Nesby events, the SWE events, Society of Women in Engineering, the SHIP events, uh, Society of Hispanic Professionals in Engineering, um, mm -hmm. all these. So these are like the three almost like diversity <laughs> professors, right? Uh, it was two two white two white men. Um, one black man, right? And they were pretty much taps because they were they had the will to do so. They're going to all the events for the student organizations. They're the ones on the diversity board for the School of Engineering. So in, in response to that question, I think I, I just want to say oftentimes faculty, those faculty who are who care about equity, who care about identity, inclusion, and black students in particular, they're oftentimes taxed in a unique way, right? Um, and they become the go-to people for all things diversity. Um yeah when you know we we need to think about how uh faculty are socialized or disciplined so supporting students across race you know so, and advising students across race in a meaningful way is supported and rewarded as much as getting that nsf grant right when you make uh you know mentoring and advising black students as uh when you reward that to the same level you reward a grant or a publication then I guarantee you will see a difference in how people approach advising and mentoring. Level of a grant or a publication. Wow. Um, that would be a big change. What a, what a great question. And what a clear and inspiring answer. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, gosh, I was going to advise people to ask more questions. And now I can't stop it from happening. Uh, we have uh, another one coming from um, Anne Fenzi at the University of Maine. Hello, Anne. Uh, and she asks, what should faculty know about your research? What recommendations do you have for faculty to create more inclusive classrooms? And did you find different experiences when participating in online classes? Those are three different and great questions. Yeah, so, yeah. so I'll start at the end. I didn't yeah, I'll, really... I'll bring it back up on stage too, so you can see it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yes, yeah, so I'll start at the end. I didn't um, do any, when I was studying, there wasn't the online class, uh, yeah. that aspect wasn't there. So I, I mean, also I can give uh, suppositions to it, right? Um, but I do want to say the virtual environment plays a big role in student life. Um, one of the things that I noticed that uh, a lot of these places of congregation for Black students and also other students in general was just it was just through group me, right? It was through um, uh, these like it was through Twitter, it was through Instagram. So the virtual, even before the pandemic's onset, uh, plays an important role in student life. Um, but otherwise, to, to faculty and creating more inclusive, equitable environments, again, like I said about uh, group work, do not assume that group work is equitable. As a matter of fact, I would probably suggest this the opposite. Think about what scaffolding, do you have to think about scaffolding? How can you scaffold group work so that people interact in like a collegial, um, <laughs> like 
not a- anti-racist, you know, anti-sexist, anti-classist way, right? And that's a tall order when you really think about it. How can you create that environment? So I said to say we need to um, faculty uh, across uh, across disciplines, but especially in the sciences, it yeah. might be useful for them to have classes on teaching, <laughs> classes on uh, you know, creating welcoming, safer environments, right? No, no environment can be completely safe, but how can you work towards it? You know, um, so that might be useful. Thinking about the disciplining of faculty, but at the very least, it's um, you know, how what are you doing as a faculty member to engage with or look out for those who are minoritized in that classroom, right? Are you spotlighting them? Are you making a comment when they aren't, you know, in class? Like, oh. Chris, I noticed you weren't in class yesterday and they're the only black men, right? That can be a little awkward. <laughs> but it, it's different if you're you you know, if you're taking time to get to know that student, inviting um, that student to your office hours, right? Um, and I think just taking that little extra effort um, for that individual student is helpful if you can't or don't have the bandwidth to try to create a uh, more welcoming, or if you don't even feel like you have the tools to create a welcoming environment, the least you can do is reach out to those students and let them know that you're there and that you will uh, you want to know about the experience in their class, right? So to what extent can we give students a voice in the class? Let them know that their feedback really matters and that we as professors will try to make changes to make their experience better. I think that's something tangible that faculty can do. Oh, what a fantastic question. And what a that was a small book of an answer uh, right there. Uh, just one quick question of my own that, to build on that. Um, do you have any advice for faculty who are adjunct versus faculty who are tenure track? Um, because I think their their capacity may be very different. Yeah, yeah for sure. And, and you know, I, I, I'm I'm always like I said, I'm interested in labor, so I'm always wary of mm-hmm. giving too mm-hmm. much labor to people I know who are already overworked, right? Especially mm-hmm. especially adjuncts, you know. And I think a lot of us are overworked and underpaid, and that comes to light, especially with uh, folks who are adjuncts um, and their relationship to the university. But you know, say I think the it goes the same the, the same route, right? To what extent can I am I making sure that I know the names of those students who may be minoritized in that place? And and what I always think about what's the least you can do, right? And I think about uh, going back to my book. There was one student who reported that she was getting uh, working in a group, a black woman working in a group full of uh, you know white men, and that the people in her the other people in her group took credit for her work and said she was she didn't do anything. If this student, this black woman, didn't have like a record of it in Google Docs, she would have got like a failing grade. So mm. she she spent mm. time putting together like a response and showing itemized how she actually did all the work. And the faculty, uh, the professor was like, "Okay, thanks." That was it. And that's not how you go about it, right? I mean, there no. has to be some type of recourse to the student, or at the very least, hey, can I meet with you, ex student? I'm so sorry that happened to you. What can I do to make this better for you? Right. So at the very yeah. least, it's honoring the experiences of students who are minoritized in your classroom, whether they're, you know, it's a black person in predominantly white classroom, whether uh, they're a trans person in a predominantly cis classroom. Mm-hmm. What can you mm-hmm. do to um, make sure when they voice a the concern that you're hearing them? Thank you. That, that was a, a, a really, really good answer um, to my peremptory question waiting in. Um, thank you for going back to the question of labor. We, yeah. we have a couple of people who want to join us on stage, um, and I want to welcome uh, Katie Evans, who is just north of you. She's coming from Bowling Green. Uh, oh, so awesome. we bring her up on stage. And hello, Katie. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. In fact, I can hear you so well, I'm going to do a fancy display. Check this out. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm doing a master's thesis right now um, in terms of you know, similar topics in some senses, but mm-hmm. thinking about senior leadership's involvement in, in particular um, in these conversations um, and that like students have been a- advocating, right, um, for, for decades for some of the same, the same things to change on campuses. And um, and I know in within like a student affairs context, we have conversations about how um, we can better educate the next generation of student affairs practitioners, But but that's on one side of, of often not as powerful on campuses, even um, one side of the house. Um, and so I'm, I'm just thinking about, and, and I'm in public administration, um, that's, my, that's my program, but I'm just thinking about how we can um, extend this beyond certain academic disciplines that are thinking about this and like 
health equity research, but what about departments that aren't um, as, as oriented to think, think through race and racism as central components to most research or central components to how we structure curriculum or um, how we do faculty onboarding and employee evaluations or all of these other aspects of campus. Awesome. Yeah. Th thank you for the comment and, and the question. And, you know, that's a lot of the, the thesis and the project. Uh, that's what's up. So I'm, I'm going to try to engage with it. If I'm off base, just, just let me know. Um, but again, like kind of like what I said earlier about how we can, a lot of it depends on what universities and institutions value, right? So it becomes a value thing. Um, as you, as you uh, stated already, a lot of this work, this advocacy, this agitation has been ongoing, right? For, for years upon years upon years upon years, decades upon decades even. Uh, so what can we do that's different? Um, one of the things that I'm kind of thinking about now in my work is um, why do we expect, um, and I'm saying like, you know, the proverbial we, right? Like, but why do we expect universities to be different, right? Um, I, I'm thinking about writing a paper. I just started started writing it just a little bit, but it's called, it, it, it'll be called Shame on Us, right? So, you know, fool me once, shame on you, uh, fool me twice, shame on, shame on me, right? But, it, you know, as, as higher ed folks, people who have been in the academy for a while or who study the academy, we know this is par for the course for universities as they, as they stand, right? This is what they do. And, and we try to shame universities, you know, try to shame the devil, if you will, right? Like, like hey, you know, you say you're for public good, like what's going on? You're, what you're doing is diametrically opposed to it. And we see that that, it, that isn't working and it hasn't worked for decades. So uh, so one, I think, uh, you know, I'm, in, I'm interested in critical race theory. Um, Derek Bell, uh, in particular, his work. And one of the things he put forth is the idea that racism is permanent and, um, you know, it's not going anywhere. And some people saw that as defeatist, but he saw a lot of opportunity in that kind of um, acceptance. So I want, and he said that we should get real about racism. And once you understand that racism is permanent, it opens up a different set of strategies. Um, so I think we need to get real about universities as they stand, right? I think there's a possibility for, you know, another university, right? Like I have this book right here, right? Like the third university is possible. I'm yes. not it. So yes. another university is possible, but as it stands, I think we need to get real about what this university is capable of. Given that we know that the public good isn't oftentimes in the, you know, the interest of a lot of universities and that they act more as hedge funds than, you know, mm -hmm. things of public goods, what does that mean that we do, right? So how can we create alternative ranking systems, I, I think, right, or alternative ways of uh, showing value? So one of the things I was thinking about, and I think you had, like, what is what would it look like for, the, you know, there's U.S. news, uh, U.S. world news mm -hmm. report, whatever, of all the... Mm -hmm top universities, right? What would it look like if um, faculty across, or, you know, faculty, staff, whoever come together and rank the uni rank universities about like, who has, you know, uh, the least amount of hate crimes, right? Yeah. And that would, that would be its own thing. So we're, we're saying, okay, you have US, US World News Report or whatever, here's our own thing. Like, here's our own value system. And here's us ranking universities on this, that, and the third. And, you know, and, and obviously that's not perfect. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, how can we, I think when we get, when we are more, um, and again, this could be a defeatist attitude, but I think when we're more realistic about what the university will and will do and what they respond to, then our strategies uh, can and should change. Um, even if that means exiting, right? I think right now we're seeing people exit the university. I mean, it seems like every other day someone's telling me, yeah, I'm trying to work in tech, right? Or I'm moving to this, I'm moving to this nonprofit. And, you know, it, sooner or later, I think the university will respond because it's going to start hitting uh, the pocketbooks differently. So cool. I think exit is also a useful strategy. Thank you for the question. And I hope yeah. that kind of gets at what you were saying. Definitely. Thank you. Oh, Katie, thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Um, and again, uh, Antar, what a fantastic uh, an essay of an answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, if you're new to the forum, friends, that's the, uh, the video question. Uh, and so if you just want to uh, follow KD and be on stage face to face, um, please just uh, click that raised hand button and uh, we'll put you up online. Um, we also have uh, another question. Uh, in fact, I think I'm going to do this as a video question just because I'm on fire about that. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, uh, we have Anne, let me see if I have her name right, uh, Anne Fenzi. Uh, and one uh, had a, uh, a video, a question she wanted to ask. And, <clears throat> Hello, Erin. Hi, how are you? 
Good. Good to see you again. Yeah, you you actually addressed my my question because you you read it before about what faculty can do, and so I I uh, I really I'm always looking for low hanging fruit, you know, the the little things yeah. that we can do, because. I feel like completely overwhelmed with how am I going to change the world? You know, like it's so racism is just so systemic that, you know, how could I possibly make a difference? And yeah. so one of the things that that was a, striking to me I, um, after reading um, from Equity Talk to Equity Walk, yeah. um, they really emphasize disaggregating data um, by race and ethnicity. I would also suggest disaggregating it by other social identities as well. Um, but then someone else brought up in the um, chat too about be ready for what you find out. Because especially if you ask your students, what is your experience like in my class? How can I make this better for you? Be ready for what people are saying. And, you know, so how as, you know, a, a very white person in a very white state, I'm in Maine, mm. um, you know, how do I and other faculty um, ready ourselves for the kinds of, of answers that we're going to hear? And, and how do we take the little steps to, to make real differences? Yeah. Now, that, 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 that's a great question. And I'm gonna engage with it to the best uh, extent that I can. And obviously, thank you for the work that you're doing out there in Maine. And I don't know if that's snow in the background, but you know, um, yes. uh, it's any warm <laughs> thought, warmer thoughts uh, from Cincinnati. But um, but yeah, I, I think that's it. I mean, I, I, I often think about what's it, what, what's within my locus of control, right? Um, and there's but so much we can do. But it's like it, that doesn't mean we uh, we uh, that doesn't alleviate us from not doing anything, right? Which I think is the point that you're you're getting at. Um, but even if it's you know, I'm going to try my best to make this classroom as safe as possible. Even if it's I'm going to work on reading, you know, do this reading group with you know some faculty. And we'll read two two books a year, right? And we'll come up with action items for ourselves, right? I mean, that, obviously, that's not. And I think it's useful to be real about what we're doing, right? Like, I'm often like my my, my hoodie says "Black Joy is revolutionary," right? I don't necessarily, th necessarily think it's revolutionary. I think it's important, but I think it's important to think about our words, right? Because um, when we say everything is revolutionary or radical, then everything. I mean, then nothing <laughs> is revolutionary or radical. And we know a revolution or radical thought implies a complete shift in thinking and acting and a whole lot of action. So I think it's useful to think about what we can reasonably do. So I like the way you're, you're you are approaching that. Um, but other things could be like, yeah, what, what can I do on a personal level? Even if it's, uh, you know, you know, at, at the beginning of our class, uh, we're going to talk about pronouns, right? And we're going to at least mention our pronouns at the beginning of class. And I'm going to say why it's useful to talk about pronouns, right? Um, and regardless of what class I'm teaching, whether it's uh, equity and diversity in higher ed, whether it's seminar in higher ed or, you know, sociology of education or qualitative methods. Right. Um, I often say, look, in this class, um, you know, I, I mentioned pronouns, but I also mentioned like, look, we're not going to use any racial slurs. I don't care if you're reading or what. I don't care if you're of that. If you're a black person, too, I'd rather you not say the N word, even if you're reading it in like a text or something. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why I do it. It's just because you never know how other people are going to respond to that. And that's one little thing, right, that uh, could, you know, just in saying that and letting folks know, hey, we're not going to do that because we want to be mindful of how people react to that. Um, that's one thing that's also going to let people know what type of space we're in. And, you know, you don't never know the type of discomfort hearing that can do to another student. I also start my classes uh, with the same refrain, right? And I know some of us may not be able to start classes in a similar way given our relationship to the university, right? And who has potentially more security or less. Um, but I often start my classes saying like, hey, regardless of what the class is, right? It could have nothing, I think everything has to do with race, but it can, it can have like nothing in writing to do with race. But I'll say, hey, in this class, right? Like, I think um, I approach my work saying like racism matters. <laughs> I actually think racism is permanent. If, you, if you're in this class and you think race doesn't matter, you know, class doesn't matter, you know, discrimination, prejudicial beliefs aren't a thing, you know, I suggest you drop this class, you know, and, I, and I, I've had students drop the class, <laughs> but it's just letting them know, this is how I approach my work. Um, and I think just in signaling that students see me as someone that they can talk to, um, or they feel like it's just that much safer, right? Um, so it's just, just little things like that can, can matter. But again, like you meant, you already mentioned, a lot of this is self-work, you know, 
Um, and it's on all of us. One of the things I often think about uh, this book that I read, Some Men by Michael Mesner. He's looking at uh, men with like progressive masculinities, right? Mm. Who want to be like feminist allies. And mm. one of the participants he, um, he uh, interviewed said, uh, you know, at every, he's like, you don't just become an ally, right? He's like, every day, like I have to earn my ally card, right? So it, it's, and I just think about that, like as it, allyship, or solidarity work, it's a process, right? And every day we're working on it. So to the extent that we can be intentional about that work um, as faculty, as staff, um, allies, you know, what have you, co-conspirators, whatever language you want to use, <laughs> it, it requires it requires work and it's a process uh, rather than a destination. So I hope that kind of gets at um, what oh, you Oh, absolutely. There was a lot of really great, great suggestions about, you know, being authentic and not being afraid to just address these issues yeah. and instead of just assuming that they don't exist, you know, yeah. especially in, you know, in a, a place like where, where I am, mm -hmm. where, you know, I have such little exposure to what a lot of, of students experience yeah. because we're such a, you know, not a diverse place. Yeah. Um, but I can't pretend that it's not there. Yeah. So I think to, to the extent you can get in front of it, I think it's helpful. But yeah, thank you for the your, your yeah, comments. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, and, and stay warm. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and what a again, uh, this this conversation is terrific. Um, uh, and we have another question coming. Actually, Leslie Harris had a couple, um, so I have to pick which one I want her to ask. Um, so I'll, I'll pick this one because it's longer. Uh, do you think there is hope in educating those students who say things like "I am colorblind"? Can they learn the role that race plays in our society, or do you think their minds are too closed? That's a great question. Um, you hear me sighing. I'm like, ooh, no. I, so I do think, I do think there is hope in engaging with those students, right? I think everyone, to an extent, should be willing to learn a lot of these things if you teach it in a white in the if you teach it in a white way, if you teach it in a right way, right? Um, and I think it takes time, it takes effort, it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of patience. Um, and I don't think a lot of that uh, work can happen in a classroom. And I'll, I'll tell you, like, if, if I'm teaching a student like that, one of the things that I try to do, I say, let's focus on uh, the readings. Let's focus on, I don't care about what you necessarily think for this. I want you to get into what X theorist would say about this, right? So even if you disagree with it, you're going to know how Kimberly Crenshaw views uh, intersectionality, right? You you should be able to do that. Um, but I th so I said to say it's not hopeless, but I think it requires a great deal of work and self work, and it's more than just uh, providing useful evidence. It's more than providing counter evidence, right? It takes a lot of intentional work, self work, and maybe that one on one work. I'll say for myself, that's not my ministry, right? I'm not trying to convince. I tell people that's nothing I, I say at the beginning. I was like. I'm not here to convince you that these things matter, right? But we're going to learn about these forces. So if you're trying to be convinced, please drop the class, you know? And I think about bad faith. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are living in bad faith. They don't want to, um, th there's this uh, quote, I think it was um, a Lewis Gordon, a black existentialist philosopher who said like, right. people rather, uh, um, people would rather a uh, pleasing falsehood than an uncomfortable lie. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for people who have these race neutral, race evasive points of view who are maybe like, you know, maybe like white people. Right. For them to see the truth in that perhaps they do have a lot of unearned privilege and power in society just based on how they're racialized, that may upset their view of themselves. So in order to protect their view of themselves, they're going to lie to themselves. Right. Because that will up in their worldview. And they just can't take it. Um, and oftentimes it takes some type of crisis for them to see otherwise. And we're seeing a lot of that, honestly, with uh, with COVID, right? People on their, you know, deathbeds denying COVID because to do so, to engage with its threat would upend how they view themselves, who they view as leaders um, and their credibility. So rather than that, they would, you know, you have people dying <laughs> rather than viewing a problem for what it is. So counter evidence isn't always a useful tactic, especially um, with something as uh, intertwined in our lives as race and identity. Well, thank you. That's a good. I, I threw a link, by the way, for Lewis Gordon into the into the chat, um, who sounds like a, another a guest we should get on the program. Um, this is uh, Wendy Williams uh, chimes in. So that's a really helpful point. Uh, 
we also had um, a couple other comments. I just want to make sure we saw. Uh, uh, Debrisa Dosu uh, recommends that we look at a piece from Inside Higher Ed uh, this morning about super HSIs or Hispanic serving institutions, and wondering if there should be something equivalent uh, for um, uh, colleges and universities that want to better support Black students. Um, but then there's also a uh, comment from Jennifer Lee Gagne. Uh, Jennifer, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and she asked, this is again from the chat, so I can't flash it on the screen, I'll just read it out. Uh, I'm thinking about how these issues are tied to institutions who are moving towards tech and STEM, no disrespect, she says, and away from the disciplines that were there from the beginning that may have been more connected to these issues, e.g. education. And that, that was an observation, not a question, but I, I'm wondering that kind of two cultures divide. Would you would you like to tackle that? Or? Yeah, oh, for sure. I mean, we're, it's going to be more and more of an issue. Like, I'm telling y'all, you know, we, we see these little Boston, uh, was it Boston robotics and those little like kind of dancing robots? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I see that. Yeah. I don't see, oh, this is cute. I see how are these how are these things going to be weaponized? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how are they going to sub, subdue people protesting? Uh, black and brown people protest and, and others right across races like people who care about justice how are they going to be leveraged uh and used um in in warfare and a lot of it's because I, I remember one student said something like oh man he's a brilliant student he was an engineering student as well and he said you know the he's like it, it's interesting because it, some of the best and brightest minds you know in, in the black community are being pushed to engineering, which makes mm -hmm. sense, you know, it's, it's money right after you graduate or tech right after you graduate. And he's like, but like, I'm using my time to figure out how to make, um, you know, the algorithm on Amazon more, you know, like better, right? I'm using my time to make um, Amazon run better or Facebook run mm -hmm. quicker. I'm using my genius to help this huge conglomerate, right? Um, so it's almost like this divorcing from like, I don't know, a lot of social needs. Uh, and I think there's just a huge need to emphasize uh, social sciences and the humanities, even in the students that I uh, I have a paper coming out, hopefully in the next month or so, that yeah. looks at how uh, students view the general education at the school. And they laughed at it. They're like, oh, it's not serious, you know? So what does it mean for folks who are gonna be in these super high paying positions across race to not be able to, or not be taught or have the foundation to think critically about social structures, right? Um, we think about like, you know, the pipeline black students in STEM, right? Mm -hmm. We think about, okay, mm -hmm. what about these black students who go into mechanical engineering and who end up working for uh, Boeing and Northrop and, and Gump, Gump, you know, all these defense agencies, yeah. right? Is it useful? Is it an equity-based venture to have black people helping to create missiles that are bombing other, other uh, countries, right? What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think these are the questions that we need to ask. Like, is this not some like number? It's not some numbers thing. It's not some representation yeah. thing. We really need that. And I think more and more we're going to see the, uh, you know, the problems of students of institutions not investing in the humanities um, more and yeah. more. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of it with these what NFTs and stuff. Like, what's I don't yeah. know what's going on, but yeah. yeah. We've had some sessions on those, and we're still trying to figure them out. But this yeah. is. Uh, um, but that's a that's a great call. Uh, that's a good, it's a nice defiant call uh, against the marginalization of the humanities and the social sciences. Um, but this is terrific, uh, and we're coming close to the end of the hour. And so, if if you uh, have questions or topics that we haven't brought up yet that you'd like to, uh, now is the time before we have to go. Um, and uh, we have a question from Richard Wack uh, from Villanova. Let me put this on the screen. Um, if I can press the correct button. With the news of Judge uh, Kentaji Brown Jackson's nomination to the Supreme Court and Vice President Kamala Harris's brave position, how can this momentum be built upon to encourage others? So I, I think that's a national, uh, federal positions. Um, you know, how can that echo down to the college and university level? That's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm curious about how um, sanitized I should be in my response. Uh, I think I open it. You like. If you if you follow me on Twitter, you you may know my response to this. But I I recently tweeted like representation doesn't really matter, right? And that that's a not a that's perhaps more um, I don't know controversial statement. But yeah. I think representation matters, but to an extent. I think sometimes we overemphasize representation, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the point that I think I really want to get at. I mean, we have 
a lot, we're, we're more and more, we're having black representation in high places, right? But if that representation is not aligned with uh, a politics that is supportive of, you know, working class, poor black people, then I don't see much, you know, power in that. You know, we think about what's going on in Chicago and the mayor of Chicago. Um, a lot of activists across race are like, what's going on? You think about uh, DC, right? And just the gentrification um, that's going on, the displacement of black people in DC. And that, you know, DC is historically led by black mayors, right? Um, and I'm curious about how many mayors uh, actually care about, you know, the uh, black people from DC. They seem to be catering more towards business interests um, and, you know, people who are coming in who are going to bring in more money, right? So just because we have a black face in a high place doesn't mean that they're um, on the same, uh, on a politic that it has uh, larger black interests in mind. And I see that often and often. So when I see that, I think about, yes, it, it may provide some type of spiritual or more or, you know, symbolic abstract value. But I'm also thinking about, OK, what how can we use this at the bank? Right. How, how is this going to provide material impacts for black people? Now, again, I know we're running up on time. I think about Derek Bell's work and mm -hmm. his work on racial symbols. Right. Uh, Derek Bell, who led a lot, who did so much work on civil rights and civil rights movements um, and these cases said that at the end of he, he problematized the Martin Luther King holiday, saying that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, this is this could be understood as a symbol. And he says, when it comes to black people, all most of us got is symbolic in nature, right? It's a promissory note. It's a bad check. We think about Martin Luther King's word, right? We're, we're, we're giving bad checks. So I look at uh, Kamala Harris, I'm looking at this judge, and I'm wondering to what extent are they bad checks, right? Because, you know, we can have these, we have Obama in, um, you know, in office, right? But what was black wealth during that time, right? What what did he do when he had the momentum? Um, you know, what he when he had momentum to support black people, he came out with this an, an, an initiative, not a policy. You know, um, and, and this is you know, yes, it is a critique of Obama, but mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm always wary of uh, black uh, representation if the politics. I, I'm concerned more about the politics than I am uh, about the representation, but I do. I do want to acknowledge, yes, it does matter. It's helpful to see these people in these powerful positions, um, but I don't want us to get uh, lost lost in that. Well, that's that's a very, very rich answer. And please be as unsanitized as you like. Um, that was that was very, very powerful. Um, and uh, that echoes your earlier point, too, about uh, uh, black uh, students ending up making bombs to, uh, yeah. to kill people or making Facebook operate a little more uh, yeah. finally. Um, so that's that's well, I, we welcome the controversy of this. Uh, uh, by the way, everyone in the in the chat was a was a discussion about uh, getting recordings of this. Uh, we have just about every single forum session up on YouTube, uh, and people have thrown in the links. Um, so here, I'll just make sure you can see this. There's the uh, web page that uh, takes you to the YouTube playlist, so you can see all of that. Uh, I say every every one of them that we can, just in case. Uh, um, every so often, we've had a glitch. Um, we. Uh, uh, we're almost, almost completely out of time. I want to make sure people have, uh, I'll make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask one question. We've got just about everybody, but I do want to ask one of you, which is um, if we could follow your advice really, really effectively with plenty of funding, uh, lots of listening, uh, and lots of actual action on the ground, what would a, a college or university um, that is majority white what would it look like if it actually served black students really well? How would it look different? What would it? What kind of ideal should we strive for? Yeah, so, so one enrollment, right? It, 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 it can be predominantly white, but if the if this has a two percent black population, uh, I'm saying it's you're not for you're not serving black students, right? Um, so I think one enrollment. I think about two. What courses are offered? What you know? Is there a black studies program there? Africana studies program there, right? Um, and Three, do you have these black places on campus? Do you have a black cultural center? Do you have a black residence hall? Um, four, are you supporting um, black student organizations? And by that, I mean monetarily supporting them, encouraging, you know, like saying, hey, we're here to support you monetarily, you know. And then I guess five, you know, the last, I'm not sure what my, what my numbers are. I'm, I, I would okay. them. Um, but I would say, you know, pay, pay black students. 
you know, I mean, I, I'm big on, again, reparations. What can we do to lessen the load for Black students? I assume that Black students are going to have to deal with some type of microaggressions in, on their day-to-day -day basis. The least we can do is pay them. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think it'd be great if we, you know, we pay, um, if we have, uh, you know, if, I mean, at least a book scholarship for every Black student at the institution. We know you're going to be dealing with wild stuff in class. This is the least we can do, you know? Um, again, black student leaders, let's pay black student leaders. We know you're going to be doing a lot of this work for the university. Your, your tuition is paid for this semester, right? Um, I think that's the least we can do um, in the circumstances. Well, those are a lot. That's a that's an agenda. That's a that's a punch list, a set of action items to go, ready to go. And speaking of ready to go, um, we have just shot past the end of the hour by a minute. So I'm afraid I need to wrap this up, although I feel like, I feel like we could go on for a great deal of time. <laughs> totally. Uh, Professor uh, Tichabukunda, what are the best ways to keep up with you besides getting your book? Is Twitter your, your yeah, name? Yeah, Twitter is good. You can shoot me an email. Uh, my university email should be available online. Uh, I, I respond to those. So yeah, Twitter or email. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And then uh, in the meantime, I hope you stay warm uh, in, uh, in, in the middle of Ohio. Uh, we'll and, and I know you can bring all of the uh, passion that you've shown today to your next project on labor, which we really look forward to seeing. Um, thank you so much for all of your time and all best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Well, thank you, indeed. Um, but don't go, friends. Uh, we just want to let you know where things are going for the next uh, few weeks. If you want to keep talking about these issues, if you want to keep talking about ways of better improving majority of institutions. Uh, look at our Twitter exchanges on using the hashtag FTTE, or you can follow me, your shindig events right there. If you'd like to talk more about this still, uh, you can go to my blog, brianalexander.org. If you'd like to think about topics that are coming up, uh, we have a whole series, everything from the climate crisis to Web3, public higher education, paying for college, transforming the academy. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. Uh, if you'd like to look back at our archive of previous sessions, which will include this one really soon, uh, just go to tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. And above all, thank you for the terrific questions today. Thank you for the great conversation. I really appreciate all of you sharing and uh, being bold and thoughtful, listening and speaking. This is a, a powerful, powerful, deep, deep topic to dig into, and I'm just delighted to be able to do this with all of you. In the meantime, good luck with uh, March. Take care, work hard, and be safe. See you online next time. Bye-bye.